Um, so, as Greg said, it turns out that we were all wrong about Carnap, um, and today I'm going to tell you why. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. So Carnap is often thought to be this kind of prototype of a logical pluralist, right? He's sort of, people cite him as like the first pluralist to show up on the scene um, and, and saying all these important things about logical pluralism. It turns out uh, he can't be a logical pluralist uh, and he can't be a monist or a nihilist. So in the Carnapian picture, he kind of has to think of um, Pluralism, monism, and nihilism, all of these questions, the questions that these, these theories are asking, they're pseudo questions for him, right? So he, he, he basically can't answer the question how many logics are correct. And I'm going to show you why that's the case over the course of today. Um, as with any uh, presentation, uh, there's a lot of sort of terms of art here. So I just want to kind of lay out what I'm going to mean by many of them, probably not all of them. So logical pluralism for us is going to be the view that more than one logic is correct, monism the view that exactly one logic is correct, and nihilism the view that no logics are correct. For most of this presentation, I'm going to focus on what Cook calls math mathematical application pluralism, which holds that there is more than one logic that can be fruitfully applied. Uh, and for most of this presentation, I'm going to argue that Carnap can't even claim that something like math is true. Uh, th there's a little caveat at the end. This is one of those papers that I wrote and I was like, oh, this is so cool and so simple. And of course it's not. Um, so there's this little caveat at the end where uh, I talk about how math might be true for Carnap, but uh, then it turns out he can't hold that anything stronger is true. Um, and map is a super weak type of pluralism anyway. So uh, I think Cook calls it trivially true and uninteresting because of that or something like this. So um, that's sort of how I'm going to use all of those terms. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about where we're going. Um, I want to talk about the folks that say Carnap's a pluralist. Um, and it's basically all the folks who talk about Carnap and logical pluralism think Carnap's a pluralist. I guess that's not such a huge surprise. But then I need to give you a few details about pseudo questions and why those are going to be important. Then most of what I'm going to do today is in sections three and five. So I'll spend most of my time explaining why pluralism just is a pseudo question. Um, and then talk about whether monism or nihilism could get out of that uh, and they can't. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call local meta framework pluralism. Most of those words won't make any sense right now, but I'll define them later on and then kind of quickly run through an example before we finish up. So let's talk about who thinks Carnap is a pluralist and why you might think he is a pluralist. This is not an unreasonable way to interpret a lot of what Carnap says, right? So um, if we interpret Carnap as being a logical pluralist of thinking that there's more than one logic that is correct, it like quite readily makes sense of a lot of the things he says, including his articulation of the principle of tolerance and this sort of famous quote that in logic there are no morals. So if you work in pluralism, you've heard this quote a thousand times, but I like it, so I'm going to read it. Um, our attitude towards the requirements of a logic is given a general formulation in the principles of in the principle of tolerance. It is not our business to set up prohibitions, but to arrive at conventions. In logic, there are no morals. Everyone is at liberty to build up his own logic, i.e. his own language. All that is required of him is that if he wishes to discuss it, he must state his methods clearly and give syntactical rules instead of philosophical as opposed to scientific arguments, right? So if we think of the principle of tolerance as just saying like, basically you give me a bunch of rules, you run with them, you tell me what you're gonna do with them. Um, it makes sense that he would be a pluralist, right? You give me one set of rules and do something with them, great. You give me another set of rules and do something else with them, also great, right? Those don't have to be the same set of rules. So why not endorse a logical pluralism? Right. And in fact, lots of people do claim that Carnap is a pluralist. They think that he, when he at, is presented with the question, how many logics are correct, he has to answer many, okay? We'll look at uh, five, of, five of them, I think, right now. Right, um, the uh, sort of book that uh, kicked us all off, um, Greg's here, so, <laughs> uh, from uh, Greg and JC, right, they say, for Carnap, plurality and logic arose because we were free to choose the kinds of languages we might use to conduct theoretical inquiry. 
So over the course of today, I'm hopefully going to show you that indeed we are free to choose the kinds of language that we might use to conduct theoretical inquiry. Well, I'm not really going to show that, but Carnap definitely thought that it's just that you can't get this plurality out of that fact, right? Um, Roy Cook, who I'm going to rely on a lot for the kind of way that he sets out the debate and gives these precise definitions to various logical views, says that Carnap's view certainly amounts to a form of logical pluralism. Um, he has kind of a caveat on this that I'll come back to towards the end of the paper. Jillian Russell, um, in the SCP article, no less, which is, as we all know, the like Bible of philosophical work. Um, <laughs> says one of Carnap's reasons for accepting logical pluralism is that he saw it as making space for innovation in logic. Again, none of these authors get sort of the motivations wrong. I think they just, we can't label Carnap as a pluralist in the end, right? So Carnap did see his view as making space for innovation in logic. It's just that that's kind of it. There's like no further question for him about whether to be a pluralist or a monist or a nihilist. Um, Stu Sapiro, right, says, now suppose we maintain following Carnap that pragmatic considerations are all that matter in choosing a linguistic framework and that each framework comes with its own logic, then we'd have a kind of pluralism or a folk relativism concerning logic, right? Um, and last but not least, uh, yours truly, uh, Rudolf Carnap's logical pluralism is one in which all connectives can and do share some though not all, uh, so share their meaning in some though not all contexts. Um, uh, I figure uh, I got rid of my bangs so I can get rid of my views too. Um, so ho hopefully we'll just run with this. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's lots of folks out there who hold that Carnap is a pluralist, right? Um, and it's just, it can't, it can't be the case. So let me tell you a little bit about pseudo questions. This might be old hat for a lot of you, but it, it's important to get sort of the details that I need on the table. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of time with it, right? Okay. Um, for Carnap, a linguistic framework is a system of ways of speaking subject to rules, right? Uh, there is a lot of debate about exactly what a linguistic framework is, right? We don't need to take a stand on most of it, right? The two papers cited here have a really interesting, well, not exchange, but the, the latter one responds to the former. Um, all we need, and I think from my kind of quickish survey of the literature uh, that most people would agree here is that um, the rules that the linguistic framework is subject to are formal and constitute a logical system. Um, of course, as soon as I say that, someone's going to point out somebody who doesn't think that that's the case, but that's sort of the rough outlines of what we need is that there's something like a logic associated with each linguistic framework, right? Um, and these frameworks sort of get set up. You set up your logical rules, just like Carnap says in the principle of tolerance, right? And you set them up in order to answer certain questions. So we might say, uh, well, actually, I think there's an example on the next slide. Okay. So um, there's a lot of questions that you can ask with respect to a linguistic framework, right? You can ask theoretical questions, which are asked assuming the rules of a particular framework. You can ask external questions, which are out asked without making any such assumption, right? Um, and then there's two types of external questions that we're going to be interested in. A pragmatic external question is just one about which framework is best to study a certain purpose or like best used for studying a certain task. And a pseudo, a pseudo question is an external question, which isn't pragmatic, right? So it's one where you're asking it outside of a framework and um, you're not uh, you're not asking about which framework is best, okay? Importantly for Carnap, these kind of pseudo questions can't be answered, right? So why do we care about linguistic frameworks at all? Well, for Carnap, linguistic frameworks are the way we kind of get around, get to do philosophy, right? So um, when we want to ask questions about uh, the way the world works or these kinds of things, we need to set up a framework in the first place, right? So we need to make clear what uh, rules we're using. And for us, that means what logical system is in place included in that. Um, and then we can only ask these questions and answer these questions with respect to these rules. And um, without those rules or asking things outside of the rules, it means basically you haven't made the game clear enough, 
right? You've not made it clear enough what you're up to, what you're asking, what your assumptions are. And so you just kind of can't answer that question. So in um, empiricism, semantics, and ontology, he has a number of examples. Uh, one is about numbers. Um, and I thought I would just kind of quickly talk through it because it, it will be kind of enlightening later on to have a good sense of just what a pseudo question is um, and how kind of innocuous they can be in a way. So the number framework is a framework, some of whose rules uh, include the fact that numbers exist, right? So when we're wondering about the numbers, we, we situate ourselves in this framework where the numbers exist and we ask the questions there, right? So when I wanna know like, oh, hey, is two prime, I like plunk myself down in the number framework and I ask is two prime and the system comes back and it says, yes, it is, right? Um, similarly, if I, you know, wanna know like whether, oh, I don't know, I always kick myself for this. I think, oh, I should think about these examples before. Uh, whether 33 is Teresa's favorite number, I, uh, I plunk myself down in the number framework and I look up at 33 and this framework had better also include Teresa now, right? Um, and I see whether 33 is Teresa's favorite number. Um, and, uh, and we can ask all these questions about numbers that way, right? These would all be theoretical questions. They're asked assuming the rules of the linguistic framework. Notice that the metaphysical question, do numbers exist? Like the big heavy hitting thing that we've spilled pages and pages of philosophical uh, ink about, right? That question is trivially true because we've put ourselves in a framework where numbers exist, right? And so when you're asking the question with respect to that framework, the answer is yes, right? The problem for Carnap comes when you try to ask these questions outside of these frameworks, right? So when I say instead of like, ah, oh, I'm assuming the number framework, do numbers exist? I just say something like, do numbers really exist? For Carnap, that's the problem. You haven't made the rules of the game clear enough. Um, we don't have enough to be able to answer that question. And so we can't answer that question. And there's some debate about it's, whether it's meaningless or un, unanswerable or something like this, but it's enough to just say for us that like, well, that can't be answered. We just don't know what to do with that kind of question. Um, okay, I think that's, yeah. So um, what we've got now are two things, a bunch of folks who think that Carnap's a pluralist uh, and this theory about pseudo questions, right? Um, pluralism, it turns out there's kind of this quick, and it's too quick, this argument that the question about pluralism is just a pseudo question. To, to figure out whether logical pluralism is true, you have to ask the question, how many logics are correct? Okay. But you don't care how many logics are correct like in the number framework. You care how many logics are really correct. Okay. You care how many logics are actually correct. Um, it's not a pragmatic question about framework choice. Okay. Uh, because we're not asking like, is, is the logical pluralism framework the best one to adopt to pursue this particular task? Uh, we're asking whether it's really true. So it's gotta be a pseudo question and it can't be answered. Uh, boo for pluralism, right? This same argument, the same kind of quick version of this argument runs for monism and nihilism too, right? It's the same thing. You just can't answer the question how many logics are correct. Uh, and so we kind of can't, we can't get the like Carnap pluralism vote off the ground. Um, good. Uh, now what you might be thinking and what is reasonable to think is something like, well, I'm no fool, Teresa. I can look at two different logics and I can see that they're different. I can see that they both make good systems of formal rules and I can see that they're both, you know, up to the task of doing their pursuing fruitfully their applications, right? If you show me uh, classical logic and you show me intuitionistic logic and tell me that you're gonna do classical mathematics with the classical logic and intuitionistic mathematics with the intuitionistic logic, I think, yes, that is good. And moreover, you don't even need to ask questions about them, right? You can just kind of see that they're different on the face of it. So we get pluralism off the ground. Um, this would be good, right? Uh, and it would be one way that we could make this quick argument more substantive. In fact, it would be one way to knock down the quick argument, right? 
Um, it would be one way to provide identity conditions for logics that would distinguish them across different frameworks, right? So essentially what we need is a way to identify logics across different frameworks that don't force us to ask pseudo questions. And just sort of looking at them um, might work for Carnap, right? It's, it's kind of a sense data me thing. So that's in a better position than these sort of loaded metaphysical questions to begin with. Um, and if we could get that to work, then we, we might be in a, a significantly better position. The problem is, of course, that that's not going to work. Uh, suppose that comes in no surprise, given that I, I've said uh, that the title of this presentation is that current up's not a pluralist, right? So we might think that just merely getting a presentation of a logic is enough of an identity condition, right? In this way, we could kind of distinguish them by sight. Um, we wouldn't need to ask the problematic external questions, right? Since we can just look at them um, and intuit about them. Now, I'm uh, in terms of Carnap exegesis, I'm not actually sure that just looking at them would would count as a non-external thing, but it doesn't matter because it's going to fall through anyway. Um, but notice, and this is really interesting, right? This isn't enough for a map style pluralism, right? Since it could turn out that all applicable logics are just different presentations of classical logic. Right? So even if I'm shown two different frameworks with things that look like different logics, right? Say I've got like one with a natural deduction system for classical logic and one with a sequence calculus system for classical logic, those sure look different, right? I would be inclined to say that that was a, a pluralism, right? I would be inclined to say if, I, if my identity conditions were just visual inspection conditions, that those two logics were different logics. Right. So I'd be very proud of the fact that I'd shown that Carnap can be a pluralist after all, because look, I can look at these two frameworks and get different logics. But in fact, uh, uh, it, it's not logical pluralism if you just have classical logic in it. Right? Um, even the logical monists think that there can be different presentations of one and the same logic. Uh, it's interesting and kind of a sidebar that, that that type of interpretation might actually be an option for interpreting Carnap. Right. So in logical syntax and language, he he presents two two languages um, uh, that map with two linguistic frameworks. Um, but they're they're both sort of like classical, classicalish, classical. Um, right. It's just that one has a, a finite language and one has an infinite language. So um, it it might be that that's actually the way that Carnap would want to go. But um, but it's still not a pluralism, right? It's not even a map style pluralism. We haven't shown that there's more than one logic that is applicable. All we've shown is that classical logics in different presentations, right, might be applicable, right? Uh, there's a really interesting paper on kind of a different topic by uh, Dijkstra and Paoli who uh, sort of present a more uh, developed argument about why what they call logical calculus or what I'm calling presentations of a logic aren't enough to get us um, good identity conditions on a logic. Okay, so what are we going to do instead? We're still on a hunt for identity conditions that will provide us um, with a way to distinguish between logics presented in different frameworks that don't force us to ask these problematic external questions. Right? There are lots of options for identity conditions on logic, right? We already saw that sort of a visual inspection option won't work. Um, two of the more common ones are that the logics have the same theorems or the logic have the same consequence relations. I, you can put whatever you want on this list, right? In fact, we could put some like super weird things on this list. Like, let's identify all the logics that Teresa has ever, you know, written about. It's a bad identity condition. It's going to identify a bunch of things that we probably have no good reason to identify, but it's one of the things that we can list as possible, right? Um, and so what we need to find, um, and what I'm going to argue we can't find, is some identity condition on logics that would allow us to distinguish between two logics occurring in different frameworks um, that won't force us to ask external questions. So um, here is sort of where the work comes then. 
if we're going to ask about whether two logics are the same, we need to do that in what, what I've called in an earlier uh, paper, metalinguistic frameworks, right? For Carnap, you can't ever ask sort of out of the blue whether two frameworks are the same or two frameworks are different, right? You need to embed them in a third linguistic framework in order to do that, right? If we were to ask out of the blue the question, are these logics the same? And ask it about whether they were really the same, you are always going to be asking an external and illegitimate question, right? But maybe, maybe we can embed these questions in the metalinguistic frameworks that I've discussed previously, um, and it would sort of solve the problem for us, right? So, um, a meta framework is one which we can use to compare and contrast two object level frameworks, right? So, uh, if we had two frameworks, say one was classical and the other one's intuitionistic, um, then we could embed those in the meta framework to see a, whether they were the same logics or different logics to compare similarities and differences between the two. In Cori 2016, I used this system to um, claim that you need to be embedding these, uh, embedding our object level frameworks in a meta framework to check whether the connectives mean the same thing or mean something different. Um, uh, Corey Kissel, uh, present day, uh, agrees mostly, but disagrees that we can think of kind of as a florist. Well, I guess I got rid of my bangs and I changed my name. So there's like two major changes that went on. So I can change all the philosophical views I want. Um, good. So let's see where meta frameworks can get us then, right? Uh, let's see if we can find a meta framework that we can embed all of these questions in and sort of solve our problems. So let's look at an example, right? I'm just going to run with the same theorems, um, identity condition for now. I'm pretty sure nothing I say depends on whether we pick this particular identity condition. I think we can pick anything to do it. Um, admittedly, I haven't like tried it explicitly, but nothing depends on this being the particular identity condition we pick. So insert your favorite identity condition for the same theorems condition if you would like. Right. So suppose that we're trying to figure out whether Carnap is a logical pluralist, and we decide that we are going to put ourselves in some meta framework to ask this question, right? And we're wondering, okay, is Carnap a math style pluralist? Can he hold that there's more than one logic that can be applied to some task, right? So the next thing we do is we say, okay, well, do A and B have the same theorems? Are they the same logic? We need a framework to ask this in, right? Since it's not a question of framework choice. When I ask, do A and B have the same theorems? I'm not asking, you know, would it be better to use framework A or framework B to pursue this task? I'm just asking whether they're the same. Right. In this case, though, we need to use something like a meta framework to discuss the question. Right. If we pick a, meta, pick a meta framework that identifies logics when they have the same theorems, then it would identify, for example, LP and classical logic. Right. If we pick a logic um, where uh, logics are identical if they have the same consequence relations, say, then it would not identify LP and classical logic. Right. So depending on the meta framework you get, then you're going to get different answers to the pluralism question, right? If we're in the framework where we're identifying logics by theorems and we've uh, decided that we're going to look at uh, the some truth paradoxes and mathematics, classical mathematics, um, then we're going to find that uh, we, we don't have a pluralism, right? Because the logic that we're going to use to study truth over here, LP, uh, is going to be the same as classical logic. So it's a monism there, right? Um, but if we pick a different meta framework, we get a different answer to the pluralism question, right? If we pick the meta framework that identifies these logics by consequence relations, then they're not going to be the same, and so we do have pluralism. In a sense, this means that for Carnap, it's kind of like frameworks all the way down, right? You might be wondering, like, well, well, it's like, the meta framework one or the meta framework two better. Well, let's put them in a, a meta meta framework and, and discuss, right? You just can't get outside of frameworks on the Carnapian picture, right? And no one wants like meta 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 frameworks to be hanging around anywhere, right? Um, I think. I'm always scared to say these things in philosophy talks because there's inevitably someone who's like, oh no, I do want that. Um, but 
anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, for Carnap, then we're sort of stuck in these frameworks. Right? Um, so what can we do here? Well, Carnap can get a can get pluralism within some meta frameworks, right? I, the example I just gave was a, an example where we took uh, LP and classical logic and embedded them in some meta framework that identified logic by their consequence relations. That's a, a pluralism -y framework, right? Um, similarly, on this slide, I'm talking about a framework that uses consequence relations to identify logic. And if you get classical and intuitionistic logic in that, in that one, then we would be pluralist. Heck, if you put classical, intuitionistic, and LP logic into a framework that identified logics by consequence relations, you're going to be pluralist, right? But uh, on the other hand, uh, in a meta framework that uses theorems to identify logics and has LP and classical logic, logic at the object level, we're going to be monist, right? So it's still not looking super good for pluralism, monism, or nihilism on this front, right? We still don't really have a way to say like, oh, hey, there's, there's actually more than one logic that's applicable here. All we have a way to say is, well, there's more than one logic that's applicable if we adopt this particular framework. Or there's more than one logic, or there's only one logic rather that's applicable if we adopt some other. And that's not quite what MAP amounted to, right? Um, so then, what it comes down to is what Carnap actually needs to be a pluralist is external identity conditions on logics. He can't have those, right? He cannot identify or, or distinguish logics outside of the framework, and that's exactly what he needs to do to be a pluralist. Um, so the, the external identity conditions on logics he needs are totally illegitimate, right? So he can't say then from one framework to another whether the logics are the same or whether they're different. If you give Carnap two, two frameworks, he, he's just not going to be able to answer the question of, of whether they're the same or different. So in effect, he cannot tell you whether there can be more than one logic that can be fruitfully applied, right? And that is exactly MAP, right? What Car we, we needed to show to show that Carnap was this really weak kind of MAP style pluralist was that there could be more than one logic that could be fruitfully applied. And Carnap just doesn't have the sort of philosophical resources to be able to distinguish logics in the way that would allow us to answer that question. Right? So Carnap then cannot even be a map style pluralist. It just doesn't even get off the ground for him. Okay, so sad for Carnap and all of us folks who have in previous iterations of ourselves said that he was a pluralist. Uh, what, maybe he's a monist or a nihilist, right? Uh, it could be, um, there's actually a, well, there's an interpretation of Carnap on which he's a monist, but I think we still get stuck with the same kind of issues here, right? But maybe he's a nihilist. Could Carnap be a logical nihilist? So he, he definitely can't be a monist, right? Because the same problems arise. Just like you can't say that there are different logics that are applicable, you can't say that all of the applicable logics are the same, right? Um, so, so that's kind of off the table. Even if we think that in logical syntax and language, he, he only gave us classical frameworks, and so he wanted us to be classical logicians, right? It's still off the table for for Carnap to be a monist because we can't we just can't answer the question if I if I give you two frameworks even if they both happen to be classical logic Carnap has no tools to say like oh yeah those are the same so we're cool um, so maybe he's a nihilist right maybe he thinks that there just are no correct logics right but in fact that's still broken right there are some logics that are correct for their applications they are fruitful in that they generate results. Um, that uh, get us to the places we want to go. We can use them to learn new things. We just have no idea how many there are. And it's not even like, you know, oh, well, there might be one or there might be 10. It's like, no, we just cannot tell how many there are. It's, it's a question we can barely even ask, right? So if I'm right so far, then Carnot can't be a pluralist because he can't tell you that two logics are different in two frameworks. For the same reason he can't be a monist, he can't tell you they are the same. One thing he can say is that some logics are applicable, no? Um, and so this means he can't be a nihilist either. Wah, wah. Um, okay. So uh, that's too bad for Carnap. Uh, here's something that's a little bit too bad for Teresa. As I was writing this, I had this realization, um, and I will tell you about it and then 
uh, tell you how I think I can get around it. So um, hack has this really nice distinction between local and global pluralism, right? Where uh, a global pluralist is someone who thinks that um, there are, there's more than one logic and they can kind of be applied everywhere. And a local pluralist thinks that there um, is, is more than one logic, but maybe they're not universally applicable, right? So maybe it's on like a case by case basis. Um, or it's contextually determined or um, anything like that, right? Um, yeah, it, and that, that sounds a lot like the principle of tolerance, right? Uh, it sounds like if we are going to talk about local and global pluralists, that Carnap ought to be a local pluralist, right? He doesn't care about these sort of universally applicable logics. What he cares about is that each linguistic framework or each useful linguistic framework, whatever that means, comes with a kind of um, uh, logic of its own and that that might be different from some of the other applicable ones, right? Uh, and then when you put them kind of side by side, I've paraphrased both of these here, um, but Hack, Hack's definition of, of log local pluralism is something like different logics are correct with respect to different things. And then you have Carnap's principle of tolerance that says pick whatever logic you would like and go from there. Those, those sound real similar, right? Um, so it's not an unreasonable thing to think that maybe Carnap is actually a local pluralist rather than a global one. Um, and that maybe the arguments I've given above um, sort of depend on thinking about him as a global one. Uh, and that, if we're thinking of sort of the basic object level pluralism won't fly, right? So um, even if Carnap is a local pluralist and holds sort of merely that, um, you know, depending on what you're up to, you can pick a different logic. And in that sense, we're a pluralist. Uh, you still have this problem about determining whether the, um, uh, whether the logics in question are the same. Sorry, I totally lost my train of thought there, right? Um, but uh, we could do this at the meta level, right? So I've just sort of introduced this kind of meta level framework, right? And certainly in some meta level frameworks, um, there is a logical pluralism, right? So, so maybe then what MAP amounts to is just that there is some meta framework in which there more than one logic can be fruitfully applied, right? Uh, and there is at least, well, okay, if, if, we, if we go ahead and think that logical pluralism might be true to begin with, there is at least one meta framework in which more than one logic can be fruitfully applied, right? Let's, um, let's take a linguistic framework for uh, constructive mathematics and one for classical mathematics, right? Embed them in a meta framework where uh, we identify logics by a consequence relation, then those things are different, we can use them both to study their field, right? They're, they're both, both those object level frameworks are fruitfully applied within this meta framework, right? And depending on how we think about map, right? All that Cook said map was, was that more than one logic could be fruitfully applied to a particular task, right? So now here I've got this nice meta framework and within that I've embedded these systems where I'm like implying intuitionistic logic to constructive mathematics and classical logic to classical mathematics. Maybe that's all it takes. Maybe that gets us this math style pluralism, right? Um, uh, that would be uh, good for the five people uh, mentioned previously and a whole host of others, uh, including a previous version of myself. Um, it, it would be bad for this present version of, of Teresa though. Okay, so let me just sort of take a few minutes to, uh, talk about what sort of happens here, right? So um, first, uh, local meta framework pluralism doesn't get us map full stop, right? But only map relativized to a particular framework. Okay, so this is a bit of a conceit, right? But it's not such a huge one, depending on what we think applicable means, okay? If we think applicable means really applicable, applicable in the real world, when I go out and like 
pursue it without thinking about, well, no one goes out into the world thinking about object level frameworks and meta level frameworks, but if we think it means sort of applicable full stop, then Carnap still isn't the kind of map style pluralist that we were hoping for. Right, because these logics aren't applicable full stop, they're applicable within this particular meta framework. Right? But if it means applicable when considered within some meta framework, then Carnap is absolutely a map style pluralist here. Um, and that's a bit, of, that's a bit of a bummer, uh, speaking sort of phenomenologically about writing this paper. <laughs> okay, um, it's not maybe though as big of a bummer as you might suspect, right? So it would be the case that Carnap would be a map style pluralist if applicable means uh, considered from within some meta framework, right? But, uh, and, and here's the sort of kind of three kickers, right? Uh, everyone talking about Carnap would be deeply confused about what type of pluralist he is, right? Because folks talking about Carnap talk about him as though you go out and you apply these two object level linguistic frameworks and they are different and that's what gets you to pluralism, right? So we would still need to rethink how we were considering Carnap in this whole debate, right? Um, so that, that's a win for Teresa, right? And we still can't answer the question of how many logics are there. We still can't say how many logics there are. We can only say how many object level frameworks there are within a particular meta framework. Right? And it seems like, you know, as a logical pluralist myself, I want to be able to tell you how many logics there are, right? I don't just want to be able to tell you how many logics there are over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and sort of the, the perhaps icing on the cake here, um, Carnap couldn't be any stronger of a pluralist, right? Um, he couldn't say, for example, so here's another example from Cook. Cook calls it, ooh, I've forgotten now what LCP stands for, of course. Linguistic language correct pluralism, maybe. Um, there is more than one logic that is correct, right? Um, so Carnap couldn't answer the questions about whether these logics are correct. In Cook's sense, correctness has to sort of match with our natural language uses of these terms. And that is definitely beyond the scope of Carnap, even if we think he can sort of rig up this map style pluralism by embedding things in meta frameworks. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, in Roy's paper, the Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom paper, he has this hedge. So he says, you know, uh, it is clear that LCP holds within Carnap account. And then in parentheses, like, oh, well, unless Teresa is right. So he says, it is clear that LCP holds within Carnap's account uh, insofar as we can ask a suitably external perspective, or insofar as we can find a suitably external perspective from which we can meaningfully formulate such global inter-framework theses in the first place. And that's just, we can't do that, is basically what the argument of this paper amounts to, right? There is no, uh, inter-framework perspective from which we can ask these questions. And so Carnap just has to kind of throw his hands up at them and walk away. Okay, so, so that's how I fixed that problem. Um, I'm sure there are more problems that you will all show me uh, in the Q&A, but this is, this is the one I discovered on my own. So big win for me. Um, okay. Uh, let's, I want to just kind of wrap up by talking through an example, right? There's kind of lots of moving pieces here and a number of definitions that can sometimes be a little bit egregious. So I figure we'll talk through an example and then, um, and then I'll wrap up, right? So let's assume um, one of the things we've been talking about or I've been talking about um, so far is sort of uh, using classical logic to study classical math and one and LP to study truth, right? Um, or depending on what you think frameworks are, using a framework that comes equipped with something that feels classical to talk about classical math and using one that comes equipped with something that feels like LP to talk about truth, right? Let's assume then that both of these frameworks are good in the kind of Carnapian sense that they further our goals. So when we apply them to our, our tasks, math or truth, um, they are fruitful and they generate results and um, all of these kind of things, right? Um, so then we wonder, okay, well, I've got these two frameworks, 
what am I going to do with them? Um, can I can I use them to check if this is a logical pluralism, right? Uh, and the answer is no, <laughs> right? We could start by looking at the two logics, right? They sure look different, right? Uh, so maybe that's enough to get us pluralism. But the problem is that they might just be two different presentations of the same logic. Uh, and, and that won't get us pluralism, right? We could embed them in a meta framework, right? If the framework identifies logics with the same this theorem, then these two logics are going to be the same. So, so that won't work. If it distinguishes lo logics with the uh, sorry, if it identifies uh, logics by say their consequence relations, um, then the two logics aren't going to be the same. So, like, are they are they really the same though? Uh, and and we just can't check if they're really the same or really different. Right. In effect, we kind of like wind up at this standstill. Like, well, I've I've got two systems. They're doing two different things. Um, but for the life of me, I just can't manage to compare them at all. Right. I'm just sort of like at this external perspective, looking at these two things in front of me. And and in order to to play with either of them, you have to kind of jump into them. And once you're in one, you can't get into the other. And, and you just kind of get stuck, right? There's no way to tell whether we actually have a pluralism here. And that's the big problem for Carnot, right? Similarly, there's no way to tell whether we have a monism or a nihilism. Um, yeah, so that's the problem. And I'm gonna uh, say some concluding things and then uh, open it up for questions. So uh, basically, um, in order to assess whether we have a pluralism, monism, or nihilism, we must answer the questions, how many logics are correct? This is an external question. Um, so we are back again to that very easy too quick argument. Um, and it can't be answered, right? Uh, so Carnap can't be a logical pluralist. And we were all wrong. Thank you. <laughs>